Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. We have Jenny West here again with us, Certified Professional Midwife. We were joking about her backdrops. We wanted to pick her something warm and sunny, and she had, uh, she was talking about potentially going to Europe in August, so we were maybe we needed some visualization of the backdrops to help with that decision. So. There you go. Yeah. So Jenny, I think the biggest thing you and I have been talking about, there's a lot of birth trauma out there. There's the, we were just talking about the book, The Big Leap. I don't even know if there's that many midwives know about this book. So I would love for, you're kind of halfway through it. I've read it three times. So tell me what oh. you found amazing about The Big Leap. How often we sabotage ourselves and sometimes we know it and most of the time we don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how that could become I don't know, a framework or a, almost like a worksheet of when we get ourselves traumatized or scared at a birth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how we respond to that. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course my brain's ricocheting all over the place right now to say, you know, just because we're the midwife doesn't mean we're perfect, doesn't mean we know everything. But the implication is that we're always gonna know what to do. And of course, in this book, that's the zone of excellence you're mm -hmm. going to have the answer and i think a lot of midwives default to that mm -hmm. we do expect ourselves to know what to do no matter what and we're not allowed to ever go oh my god yeah. and if we do do that we got to wait and do it later in the car because yeah. the client doesn't need to see that mm -hmm. but then we're still stuck with it it's sitting there like a big old toad waiting to get us later the next mm -hmm. time a birth even mimics what we just yeah some subconscious i mean they were talking about 95 yeah. percent of what our body does is on autopilot like deep deep levels in the subconscious that we're only slightly comprehending what is physically occurring and we don't even realize it mm -hmm. well and that's a whole other rabbit hole down uh bruce lipton's work Mm -hmm. of how we're hardwired before we're seven yeah. and how ingrained that is and of course he's quite fascinating to listen to and read uh but yeah um i don't know there's so many varieties of this like i just had a phone call a couple of days ago with a client uh, or uh, was going to be a potential client that i just can't take her so we had a long discussion about how to figure out you, what she wanted and she had had come to me with a previous birth because she had a less than optimal outcome in a previous birth how's that for diplomatic um mm -hmm. and then of course this birth brought up a lot of fear in the father of the baby some anxiety for her and then it went so well as every midwife envisions you know, you're not going to need me because your body knows how to do this. The baby knows what to do. If you need my skills, it's going to be so teeny weeny because you're doing your homework, you're asking the right questions, all that stuff. So when she just said, well, what do you mean you can't be my midwife? And I said, well, I'm just not going to be available when you're due. So I had a long discussion about how to figure out what she wanted, how to prepare to even talk to another midwife. And we went the whole spectrum. What if, what if you didn't hire a midwife? What if you had an unassisted birth? How scary or comfortable or uh, how does that make you feel? What questions would you ask then if you knew nobody was coming? How comfortable is the father of the baby? Is there somebody else you, you know? So that opened up this whole other vein of conversation and she says how come nobody asks you this the first time you're pregnant and it's like uh, because most people are doing what the rest of the country is doing is they get their pregnancy tests and they go to the hospital and they don't want you to be thinking these things the medical yeah. model that's too time consuming to have an educated client uh mm -hmm which I, don't, I mean that in the nicest way. Yeah, it's it a different system. Can't. It's it's not it's not created. I yeah. mean, the insurance world, the the, the, the business, exactly. the profitability, it's not, it, they have no control. I mean, they won't survive if they don't treat patients in this certain way and style. So yes, I well, if, really understand. If you suddenly had to see 30 people a day, you would be cutting way back on what you're willing to answer and talk about. So one mm -hmm. of the benefits 
of the midwifery model and private practice. So uh, some of that plays into now when a midwife gets broadsided, she sort of has to ask herself the same types of questions. What do I want? What do I not want? What, uh, why did that scare me? How come I didn't know what to do? How could I figure out what to do? Almost the same foray into how do I examine this and figure out what I right. want and what makes me comfortable. And I'm still surprised when I talk to students who also get traumatized in a different way because they're not by themselves, but they still saw what they saw and they're watching their preceptor or the senior midwife do whatever they're doing or mm -hmm. not doing and coming to their own conclusion. So it's a little different yeah. aspect of sort of the same thing. But I'm constantly surprised that nobody ever considers tightening their practice protocols. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, uh, one of the first midwives I uh, talked to had a run of things that was just hair raising. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and it was like, okay, okay, uh, for a little while, maybe don't take your friends. Mm -hmm. There was a common thread there. She knew these people personally and yeah, because that they were pregnant. In place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe you weren't making good decisions because you really like Susie Q and you didn't want what you knew was waiting for her to happen. Uh, maybe you don't turn a blind eye to maybe a breach or maybe a set of twins. Maybe for a little while, you make that a little narrower. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I part of it is linked with the stigma that as you're a more experienced midwife, you need to take less and less with you. It's those newbies that carry everything but the kitchen sink. And as they get ah, more experience, yeah, that's another myth and misunderstanding. The more experienced that I think. midwife is the one that's going to break the rules. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to break the rules, whatever that is in your definition, mm -hmm. outside your circle of comfort, truly against the law, according to the practice guidelines or regulations, you have to be really clear about where your boundaries are and what you are willing and not willing to do. And of course, that can open up all kinds of cans of worms prior to the event. Do you admit that you know what's going on, that this baby isn't head down? Or do you just continue to say, ah, yeah, blah, blah, and hope yeah. it all goes okay because now there's no evidence after yeah. the fact? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I can think of specific examples while you're talking, Jenny, like, okay, I was a year and a half out and I used to think, of course, they can decide if they don't want <coughs> a vaginal exam during labor. Of course, that's a choice. Like I just checked the baby's position a few days ago. And when you get your first private breach and you see a buck coming out, you say, you know, a part of my basic standards is everybody when I first get there is one basic vaginal exam. And like, you know, like that's my thought process is like, I, I respect and inform choices, but I also have a basic level of my comfort level to ensure exactly. and assess. And so, yeah, I, I was thinking all these things as you're talking. <laughs> and see, part of me, like if we were doing peer review about that, which is a safe place to sort of decompress and pick apart. Um, what would you have done if you had checked that person? Would you have backed up, thrown your arms up and stuffed her in the car? Yeah, I mean, yeah, being a first time mom, I was thinking about that, like when I got there and how long she was in labor. I mean, she was in good transition when I got there. And yeah, it would have been like, now I'd have been more anxious sooner. And would it have really been safe to transport versus she's early? I mean, yeah, those are those tough things to think about, like, what stage is safe for a breach transport or XYZ transport when they're close to delivering? Mm -hmm. And of course, I would add the monkey wrench and what's waiting for her. More panic. Mm -hmm. Okay, C section, yeah. potential yanking, depending on, because I have found that getting in the car makes everything progress. Yeah. I don't know if it's because a decision's been made or the jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. I think it's all that rock. And I honestly think it's all yeah. the wonky positions you get stuck in, in the car and you're shifting all the time to get, yeah, I think that's more. <laughs> or maybe it's like, oh my gosh, I've scared the midwife. I better let get this baby out before anything else happens right because they're picking up on all the energetic stuff that's going on right too 
even if you think you're covering what you're feeling, that you're hiding it. Right. My clients have told me that I have a voice, that there's a shift in the tone of my voice that it's like, okay, we're not messing around anymore. Yep. This is what we got to do. And we've got to do it now. And of course, the people who knew me before says, oh yeah, that's your law enforcement officer voice. <laughs> that you don't call your clients ma'am. But when I did all that in a previous life, they, my coworkers knew that if I started calling you sir or ma'am, you were in big trouble. That the extra CF, you know, the codes that I could put on to your ticket that right. were generic yeah. enough to just make you pay more. Yeah. That well, and from up. our other interview, if people hadn't watched it, Jenny was a park ranger at Yellowstone. So we talked about her midwifery journey last time. So if they don't know randomly what you're talking about. Oh, right. Then yes. Being, being a, a park ranger for the National Park Service, yep. law enforcement, paramedic, wildland and structural firefighter, and able to do the campfire talk by the interpretive aspect of my job. It's perfect training to be a midwife. Yeah. Back to that level of excellence and expectation that I'm going to know whatever your question is. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew that that was perfect prerequisite training? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So as far as birth trauma, there's just, I think nowadays midwifery is so fragile. There's so much burnout. There's so much trauma in all aspects of life, not just in the birth experience. And I'm seeing more and more of a need when I I'm seeing the transition, even the last six, eight months, my consulting clients are getting less and less business. How do I grow? How do I expand? How do I improve things to more of that survival state and trauma and just really needing emotional life coaching support more than business consulting right now. Um, and so, yeah, I've been feeling that trend too of just, there's so much trauma in the world. And then especially when you're trying to support people and you're trying to be more than you humanly can be, whether you feel guilty right. and you're taking more clients and you, you just, you're hoping everything will work out. And then the numbers are not in your favor because you pushed the envelope of too many people to take nine months ago. Like I, I'm seeing that ripple effect happening. Yeah. And, and I, I, I guess I do this sort of off the cuff. I've always extended the please don't sit in silence and suffer. If it took, you know, I, I remember when I was a much younger midwife that if a midwife is calling you in the middle of the night, you need to get in the car and go over there. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Mm -hmm. If that midwife has beat whatever this issue is to death enough to pick up the phone and call you. And even if you're not going to do anything, the support of taking a look at it is mm -hmm. yeah. invaluable. Yeah. Uh, and we had that, I had that rule for a while. If I was at a birth for 12 hours, I called somebody yeah. to say nothing's wrong, but something might be not right. Let me give, give you an overview and you can help me pick my brain. Uh, mm -hmm that could a be different really perspective bad. and maybe they give a different suggestion you didn't think of because yeah. you're in the thick of it and you've been there a long right. time and you're tired too <laughs> and that might be sort of a, a good rule of thumb after the birth as well after you've had some sleep and some food yeah. you know some of the homework that i'm grading i'm i'm teaching about progress notes and how that's a valid part of the charting particularly when something goes sideways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember some aspect that now that you've had some sleep and some food and some distance, you picture something that it's like, oh my gosh, I never charted that I did put the Doppler on all clock, you know, whatever, whatever the issue yeah, is. Yeah, you're just putting the high level quick notes. You're not really going in depth. Um, I think that's a big difference between nurse midwives that were labor and delivery nurses beforehand because we're used to being surrounded by such a legal click, 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 tell a story because you're just, you're so, I've noticed that big shift if you've never been on the other side of the legal defense training and exposure you're, you're a little more nonchalant with your charting because you don't realize how important it is to protect you later um and, and telling a story and learning and, about and, and yet i would argue with you that sometimes you don't know how critical the chart is until the birth is complete right. you have no idea that at two in the morning that some turn of events in hindsight now might have been a critical 
piece of information, which is where the progress note comes in. And I'm not sure where this idea got started that a progress note doesn't count, or it's not as real, or it looks like CYA. Mm -hmm. Legally, it's just as good as if you wrote it at 2 a.m. Right. I, I'm is, not saying real time it, versus later, but yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of midwives across the country that just don't even write a progress note. They just put the heart tones, they put the delivery time, they put the basic well, statistics versus, yeah, like I, I, real time versus charting it later is, is minor in the bigger scheme. But the reference point of, I, I see very different perspectives if you've been exposed to certain systems of how you're taught to chart or your preceptors. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. And see, after I had my first, really, I'm not qualified to be a midwife, things going sideways. I'm not qualified to dress myself, let alone attend your birth. Don't hire me. That type of, of event. I was so traumatized that I refused to chart. Hmm. I had a blank piece of paper in my file that I would write down what happened at the birth and I would chart it afterwards because hmm. it's like, because I don't know what's going to happen. I can't possibly chart this correctly until it's all over. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for a chunk of time, my entire charting was a progress note. Because mm -hmm. yes, I scribbled one line entries in, but I was not charting. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, I always practice by myself. So that changes yeah. how you chart as well. Yeah. Yeah, so but, what's the purpose so, of it is not to communicate with yeah, the team yeah. and clearly. But yeah, I think just going back to our whole point is, birth trauma is so emphasized on the trauma to the tear the c-section being abused as a client a patient but we don't get nearly this discussion of the healthcare practitioner's perception of the abuse and the trauma and the the, the debriefing and the the professional burnout we we're only getting a tiny piece of the understanding it's the good work-life right. balance you're working too many hours it's being exposed to so many vulnerable points in people's lives and we're not processing the trauma appropriately right mm -hmm. right and and yes i mean i i was trained that yes you can cry later mm -hmm. and 30 years later i'm sure some of that stuff is still sitting there uh and that you are supposed to just suck it up and there but there comes a point where you can't hide it anymore i feel like i've even seen it in the birth room when i'm working with other midwives that you know they're not present yeah. their face and their body language has gone back to whatever's happening is reminding them of so they're not even in the moment anymore they're back to that originating event or they put a wall of empathy up because when they try to open that, then the other negative feelings come out, not the positive embracing supporting one. I, I've noticed that since my, even the trauma of five years ago, like the shift of demeanor of how you labor support, how you, you're almost putting a subconscious defense wall up because you, you don't want those emotions, whatever positive negatives are going to come out in the moment. Um, cause you feel like you have to have such a guard up. It's just, yeah, it's a weird feeling The that like, I talk a lot about like as a new baby midwife sometimes that innocent and green and just birth is amazing and awesome is a good thing like how can we revive that again <laughs> how can we right how can we i say that i say that to my students all the time i want to thank you for wanting to be a midwife because yeah. we need the next generation of eyes and ears and and impressions to keep this where it should be instead of because i also when you were talking it's like Oh my gosh, I've worked with midwives that tell their students that there's no talking during the labor mm -hmm. so that nobody inappropriately says anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's like, gosh, how isolating for the laboring person right. that there's no discussion. Yeah. You know? Uh, anyway, so yeah, we've seen yeah. all Well, and I've had that a few times with some doulas where they want to respect the birth space so much. Like, we're going to have a side conversation with the birth assistant. She just got here and they're like, inter like, yeah, it's very interesting that culture perception of how do you protect the birth space is having little side conversations when the woman's internal in her own space. Is that being disrespectful or like, yeah, like there's, we could go deep down the rabbit hole of what oh, is yeah. a true birth um, space supposed to be like and yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, all this, we've done it organically here, that having some place to just even tell the story, having some place to talk about this and that 
Because then there's a lot of anxiety around and fear around that too. That mm -hmm. if I tell somebody, I think I miss the cues or whatever their fear and their internal dialogue is. Yeah, the judgment of, well, they're not going to think I'm a safe midwife because I told them this happened and this happened. And yeah. I, mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm not sure how that gets like taken out of the equation. I mean, I've always gone with peer review because it's non discoverable. But is there a way without, like, you know, is it better to talk to somebody you don't know? Is it better to talk to somebody that you do know because then they know your weaknesses and, and strengths? Yeah. Someone you that know? knows you in the midwifery professional world, or should it be just your warm market? Or should I mean, like, I'm a big fan of counselors and life coaches and midwives that are experts wanting to get that trauma certification, that trauma expertise to advocate because you have a specialized way to ask questions, give objective perspective. Because I think sometimes a friend they'll just be like, oh, well, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then it becomes a vicious loop of not actually actually solving the problem too so right. um yeah right and then and then activating all that and then just putting it right back in the same shoe box and putting it right. up on the shelf that mm -hmm. makes no sense so right. yeah uh I don't know. Yeah, I, I would love to see you was... and I have brainstormed uh, when we're not doing the recording, like the idea of a national peer review. And maybe we'll just put the plug out there. If people want to email you and say, oh my gosh, I'd be interested in something you start. So then we could do a trial run of it. But it's a combination of something with you in a series that's that protected realm. Plus, maybe we get involved somebody that's more of a formal counselor, a moderator, somebody that can be outside perspective, either participating or having alternating meetings with them. So you get the nice combination of a midwife that gets what you're doing, but then you're also getting somebody part of the support that specializes in trauma and specializes in post-traumatic stress disorder, because then you're getting the best of both worlds. So I love these brain sessions with you because you and I come up with the coolest stuff. <laughs> well, and I, I, I like the idea of it just being an experiment. Uh, uh, let's do a trial here. Yeah, see, see what the feedback, see, see what, what people, because we need is. something, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if if the step one is talking to another midwife who's been there, done that, good, you know, maybe that's all you needed and maybe now, or maybe now you know, let's get somebody who maybe isn't looking at everything through the filter of a birth worker, right. you know, I went through that period where I did all the business classes that had nothing to do with midwifery, because it was like, there's got to be some common threads here that make midwives more successful that are already out there without having to reinvent the wheel um so that could be the same thing i don't know i think what we do is so unlike anything else yeah uh, yeah, I have a consulting client that she ran like five other businesses before her midwifery practice. She's in her late 50s. She had like like a shoe store, a grocery store, like complete different industries. And and she hit me home when we did our second consult and her severe burnout like Midwifery practices are the hardest businesses to run. I would do, I could do cakewalks with all my other businesses that I ran compared to a midwifery practice. Like she hit me home when she said that. She knew her stuff. She'd run all these other businesses. She's like, I had no idea this challenge, this challenge, this challenge, this challenge, like things that no other businesses have to even deal with being available exactly. emotionally for your wedding cater that's available 24 seven. It's the prime time in someone's life. They memorize it forever. You've got weird regulations and guys, I mean, you just we get hit in every direction with our profession of trauma like we just do and how can we create more resiliency how can we create more support networks so that we can at least relate to each other and feel like okay i'm not the only one going through this how do we change this not me just feeling like i'm changing it and you just feeling like you need to change it not the only one going through this that yeah telling our stories validates or expands the possible solutions or options so how is it that we got in a place where we can't talk to each other mm -hmm. which that's a whole other can of worms if you you know what, yeah. what depending on what television shows you're watching um right but isn't that too bad yeah yeah, because how do we there's shift this? We've got to start somewhere. I mean, people exactly. look at the end results and they get too overwhelmed, but you've got to make it into tangible bite-sized baby steps. You can't get to the utopia next week. It'll take years, maybe many, many years, many generations, but you have to shift and start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah, I mean, my anybody that I've graded their homework, anybody who have always offered that. So maybe we need to formalize it a little bit. Something a little more structured um, to open up to the public and seeing that maybe it's a formal structure where there's now segmented volunteers that are did the past peer review and kept it cost effective. Like we could make so many wonderful so that the midwives that went through the program, the midwives that went through the past peer reviews are now part of that support network. And yeah, there's a lot of directions, but I just, I think it has to be started somewhere. I loved your idea last time we talked when it wasn't recorded just about a structured peer review on a national level that zooms and you go through the actual trauma debriefing process and just giving an opportunity for people to just vent and talk and have a neutral space right. to have someone because a lot of midwives across the country feel so alone they just they are sometimes many times very they alone right and, mm -hmm. and they just carry it and carry it and carry it and then nobody understands why they just quit one day and they went off and the deep like end they, and, they everybody, and their family can't relate it's like well like I, I joke but don't joke my family probably on the outside you just look like a crazy person because they don't see the 99 percent. you just hit it you just kept it quiet they don't see the craziness if you don't tell them how are they going to understand and help you like it's it's difficult yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely so, well, Jenny, I appreciate your knowledge. And yes, I'll put your email at the bottom if people are saying, oh my gosh, Jenny, I can relate to everything you're saying. I would love to help you with this program, this some sort of thing getting going, or I want to be part of your first trial that we're going to experiment. I would love to put the plug out there so that I, it's so needed. I mean, half my consulting clients nowadays, it's not as much business and improving systems. It's the survival of I am so traumatized right now. Help me survive to next week is happening more and more. Yeah. So, so yes. Thanks. Yes. Okay. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Jenny. And we will do this again in a few months. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>